Welcome everybody to this week's Lumix Live session. Uh, we're going to have a really kind of fun conversation about wildlife photography today. Uh, I know a lot of you are in the chat asking about the uh, the recent teased uh, announcement of the uh, Lumix S5. Uh, we do not have any information during this stream to talk about, uh, so just stay patient. Uh, we will have more information coming. Make sure to tune in for the streams that we do on the second and uh, our Lumix Live that week. So uh, hopefully, I know you guys have a lot of questions about that, but we, we just don't have any information on this stream. So now that that's out of the way, <laughs> if this is your first Lumix Live, I want to say uh, welcome. And, uh, you know, this is a, a weekly program that we run uh, on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern time, where we cover a vast majority of different topics. Sometimes they're product specific, sometimes they're topic specific, more like this week's. Uh, but we, we really encourage the conversation with all of you. So if you guys have questions that you want to ask myself or our guests on these streams, make sure to tag at Lumix cameras uh, in the chat here. Uh, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can. Uh, questions that are off topic for this, the session, we may not have answers for, or we may just not be able to answer. Um, so feel free to keep dropping them in there, but we just may not get to them or may not have answers for you guys. We have uh, my... Uh, Teammate uh, Jack Salamanchek is in the chat as well, monitoring questions. So if you guys have uh, questions that we can't answer on the stream uh, for time or topic related, we may have answers that way for you. So make sure to keep dropping them in there. Again, if this is your first time or if you are a returning viewer for this, make sure to like and subscribe to the Lumix Cameras channel, the one that you're on right now. It helps us and it goes a long way to allowing us to continue doing these kinds of events to be able to work with all of you and get questions answered. So with that, I want to uh, bring our guest on today and let me make sure I got my switching right. There it is. <laughs> So uh, I'm, I'm joined today by our Lumix ambassador, John. How are you, John? Doing good. Thanks a lot for introducing me, uh, Sean. It's great to be on here. Yeah, yeah. So our, our topic for today is wildlife photography. Um, and, and obviously, we, we cover a ton of different topics between photography and videography. And I think you've got a lot of background information that can really you know, help get, get some people comfortable in this field. Uh, we, we have a, a vast majority of images that we're going to be showing and kind of talking about as well. So for those that are either not up to date as to who you are uh, or aren't in the region where they can see or where we used to be able to actually go out and see everybody speak in person, uh, <laughs> could you give everybody kind of a uh, background as to who you are and, um, you know, just, just kind of a bio? Yeah, sure. So my name is John Bryant. Um, I'm principally a wildlife photographer. Uh, I also shoot landscapes, uh, a little bit of nature and macro photography as well. Um, I'm actually based in Belgium. I've lived in Belgium uh, 20 years, but from my accent, you'll tell that I'm originally from the UK, which is where I currently am in quarantine because uh, I've just come back and we're not allowed out. So um, unfortunately, I can't get out to shoot. But uh, yeah, my, my background's kind of um, a little bit unusual. Um, I am actually a professional photographer, but I'm a part-time professional photographer. Uh, I fell into wildlife photography completely by accident. Um, so I'll maybe tell that story a little bit because I think it's quite interesting for a lot of people that might be interested in getting into wildlife photography. Um, so yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm a corporate, corporate guy. I, I work a corporate job. Uh, about seven years ago, I got downsized. It happens to everybody. And um, decided to take a trip to uh, South Africa and uh, basically fell in love with the bush. And at that time, I actually had the GH3. Um, I'd been shooting kind of micro four thirds since about 20, uh, yeah, from 2012. Um, and the GH3 really caught my eye because I, I, I was mainly coming from a background of videography. Uh, I was kind of an amateur videographer, uh, shot a few weddings, did a few corporate videos, uh, helped out friends here and there. And I really liked the Lumix systems because they were very small, compact, they had a great image. Um, went to South Africa and I principally was shooting video there. Um, and what happened was I, I made a, a video, um, shared it with the lodge. They loved it. Um, they started using it in, in promotions and, uh, and I'll give a shout out to the lodge a little bit later on in, yeah. in, in the live stream. 
because um, the South African tour tourism industry really needs a helping hand right now. Um, but yeah, um, basically I went back. Uh, and the second trip I went back, um, I actually started to shoot more stills. Um, that took me into around about 2014. And so I was just building a portfolio. Um, and it was actually the launch of the 100, 400 millimeter lens, um, which piqued my interest uh, to upgrade my camera to the GH4. I then got in some to, into some discussions um, with Panasonic at the photography show in Birmingham. And a few months later in 2016, became, uh, became an ambassador uh, and I turned professional. So yeah, quite a lot of the, I would say the, the planets aligned for me, which was really cool. Um, and I've been a very proud uh, brand ambassador since then. And uh, yeah, been returning to Africa, trying to really expand my portfolio, getting, getting into lots of different pro projects. Um, and my, my key passion is really trying to show how the camera features and benefits can, can help shooters um, create much more original Im imagery. Uh, I think we've got very powerful cameras. Um, and I think uh, if you can kind of understand what those features do, you can come up with some really creative stuff. So, yeah, that's a little bit about my background and my introduction. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's kind of one of the, one of the things that that um, today's stream is really going to focus a lot on is, you know, with photography and, and the tools that we have and specifically for wildlife photography, like we're talking about today, there's. A lot that kind of goes into, you know, the, the questions that, that, that we get all the time. You know, what, what camera should I buy? Or, you know, what lens works best for this kind of platform? It's, there's a lot that goes into it. And it's also, I think, a surprisingly easy conversation as well. Um, could you give us kind of a, a, a rundown of what your, your current kit kind of looks like yeah. uh, when you go out? I think it's a really good question, Sean, because, again, when I came into wildlife uh, probably about seven years ago, the domain was really uh, monopolized by the two big brands. Um, and there's a lot of camera snobbery out there. So like in wildlife, if you haven't got like a lens like yeah, that big and deep pockets, it's like, what well, do you know? Right. So um, we would say all the gear, no idea, basically. And it, it, it's not about how big the lens is and not. It's not about how expensive your camera is. It's about what you do with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that Lumix has done an incredible job in, in what I call democratizing wildlife photography. Um, the, the current kit that I have in my bag um, allows me really to travel. Uh, well, in the pandemic, we're in lockdown. But, <laughs> you know, the, the, the past seven years, I, I typically get to Africa maybe two or three times a year. So... You know, I don't want to have a heavy, heavy bag. I really don't. Um, if you try to get to Southern Africa, you know, you're going from, from flights out of Europe into Johannesburg, you're often getting on small hopper flights into the bush. Um, often those small hopper flights won't allow you to take big bags. Um, and if you just take like, uh, there's three routes. I won't mention, the, I won't mention the, the company's names, but you can go out of Paris, <laughs> Germany or the UK. Um, or the Netherlands. So if you go out of Germany, you, you know you're going with the national carrier. They only allow you eight kilos. Uh, if you go with the French national carrier, you've got about 10. Uh, the British national carrier, it's a little bit more, a little bit more generous, but like 10 kilos is not a lot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is the real advantage with the Lumix systems. And so my, my, I've got in front of me a little bit of the equipment I, I tend to use. I'll, I'll just go through it, sort of the shopping list as it were. So my kit bag would typically contain like it's my primary stills body is the g9 um now i do have the battery grip for that but i typically only use that when i'm on domestic shoots uh, again just to save a little bit of space and weight and then uh, the g9 is always attached to you can see here in camouflage the uh 100 400 millimeter f4 6.3 lens so just for folks that maybe don't know the micro four third system like a hundred millimeter to 400 millimeter lens on the equivalent of what used to be the old 35 millimeter cameras in the old days, the full frames, it's a 200 to 800 millimeter uh, equivalent focal length. So, so this is an incredible lens to be able to really fill the frame. If you're shooting in certain uh, national parks and reserves in Southern Africa, sometimes you can't get close to the subjects. In Kenya, for example, if you go to Amasele, you have to you have to stay on the roads. Same, I was in in the Kalagadi um, KTP in, in South Africa last October. 
you have to stick to the road. So you really do, do need a long lens to be able to, to get those subjects. What I then tend to do is my second body, which I don't have with me, um, it's the GH5. I was actually shooting wildlife with the GH5 before the G9. And in fact, before that, I was shooting wildlife and birds with the GH4 as well. So they're, they're very capable cameras. But I, I have this other lens here, which is the, the 50 to 200. Uh, I think it's f2.8 to 4. It's, it's super, super lightweight. I mean, if you were to look at that as a full frame, I mean, it'd be like twice as big. Oh, yeah. um, this is a super sharp, beautiful lens. Um, so that gives me the equivalent of 100 to 400 on a full frame camera. And then I, I have um, typically two other lenses. I have the, the 12 to 60, which is a good general all rounder. So again, for full frame enthusiasts, that's like 24 to 120. And that's super lightweight. Um, and then I have the eight to 18 millimeter, uh, which gives me a really wide option. And you think, well, why would I need wide for uh, wildlife? Well, believe it or not, if you're out in Africa, there's going to be landscapes, but, uh, in fact, I'll just, just show you the reason why. So if I get really close to an elephant, I can just basically flip that screen out, twist it, and then put the camera super low with a wide angle, lean out yeah. the vehicle. And I've got basically an elephant with, with sky and clouds and, and, you know, the whole of the African savanna behind it. So I typically take four lenses, um, two bodies for stills. Uh, I do shoot video as well, but I can get onto that a little bit later on. Um, and then I'll just mention one other lens because um, Panasonic gave me a, a loner uh, last year, um, which I just want to highlight because I had a lot of fun shooting with that. It was the 14 to 140 millimeter. So it's kind of like a, a 28 to 280 equivalent. That's the Mark II. Um, that's an incredible all-round lens. If you're just starting out uh, in, in any kind of photography, but specifically for wildlife, it's got a great focal length. Uh, and I was having a, a lot of fun because it's actually got a, a very close uh, minimum focal distance as well. So I was yeah. putting it on the ground at our coffee breaks and then using the app at distance. Uh, and basically the birds were coming up to the lens and I was shooting some images really low angle, very close to, to some of the African birds. So. Yeah, those are the, typically the lenses that I would I would go to yeah, for any yeah, any trip I take out to Southern Africa. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, you know, so for for our uh, uh, U.S. based uh, uh, customers, you know, when you mentioned like the the ten kilos, so that's that's twenty four pounds. That's now that that includes all of your equipment, right? Like camera, yeah. clothes, everything that you need. Well, it's hand, the hand luggage. So yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's 22, 22 pounds hand luggage. I can then take like up to twenty kilos in the hold. But again, if if you're doing the the um, if you're doing like the the plane hops, so the the small planes out of Johannesburg into the bush, they typically have a restriction of ten kilos as well. So you've got to travel very very light. Um, yeah. Again, just to show you, like this is the hundred four. There's a lot, like a tripod base plate. Now mine's not on here. Which if you're a if you're an avid shooter like me, that will give you a clue as to whether or not I use it on a tripod. <laughs> and if it's not on there, it tells you that I don't use it on a tripod. And there's a good reason for that, which I can talk about, but I'll, I'll just give you a hint to it. It's like this camera is so lightweight with in-body stabilization, optical stabilization. There's, I have no reason to put it on a tripod. So, yeah. 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 No, that's, that's, that's awesome. And, and, and you know, that's, that's that, that big advantage. Why micro four thirds is, is in my opinion, always going to have a home in, in the industry because, you get those size advantages. Yes, there's the equivalency conversations that everyone loves to have online, but the the proof is in the results you get out of it. And I'll I'll switch over in a, in a little bit to the uh, images that you sent over for us to um, to share. But you know the 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 quality of the glass, the quality of the camera, they're all amazing things to have and and to get the best technologies that you can get and there, there were a couple of questions about things like 6k photo and and using video to get better stills if 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 a camera is large and heavy you know it 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 can limit where you're going to actually go with those products and a lot of people ask us you know well with with micro four thirds and and now that we're in full frame with the l mount you know, what's the future of, of micro four thirds. And we've, we've always said, you know, and, and committed that, you know, the micro four thirds line is always going to continue to grow. It's always going to be here. Um, <clears throat> the launch of the, of the S series is, is an addition to all of that for those that, 
you know, don't need to be concerned about size and weight and, and that kind of the platform. But, you know, kind of echoing that echoing the weight restrictions and kind of the advantage of that size, you know, for those that have seen these streams here, I, I ride a motorcycle and I don't always want to carry my S1 with me, you know, or my S1H, you know, I want something lighter that I can still get really good solid imagery out of. And the, the G series is just perfect for that. You know, the yeah. 30 something plus lenses available. So, you know, portrait photographers, landscape, wildlife, you, the, there's an option there for everybody. Um, so uh, you, you, just like I said, there was a question about, or really more of a statement about, you know, how higher resolution video is becoming, you know, so, so important obviously in the video side, but in the wildlife and the photography side, there's a lot of advantages there as well. Um, could you give us a little insight uh, or, or comments on, you know, the use of things like 4K photo or 6K photo um, in the yeah. field for wildlife? Yeah, I, I think it's a really versatile tool to have. Um, so, you know, I think when, when it first came out, um, there were a couple of scenarios that I used it on. Um, so first of all, you have to think about that video clip that you get from the 4K 6, 6K photo as being kind of like your digital negative. Uh, and then in camera, you basically scroll through and you can slice out the specific JPEG you want. Now, I would, I would really recommend the 6K or 4K photo function if you're just getting into wildlife photography because, you know, you, you mentioned, Sean, about the idea of the weight being a constraint to get to places. Well, the weight's actually a really big constraint on getting sharp shots. You know, if you've got, I won't, I won't mention the name of the brand, but if you've got <laughs> one of the traditional brands where you've got the, the, the lens out here, you've got to have like, you know, serious guns to hold it. If you've got low light, you've got to sort of shift your ISO up to get a shutter speed that's fast enough. And if you've got a fast moving object and you're panning with it, if you're like, your shutter speed is, is under the minimum focal length. So, if, you know, if you've got 400 millimeters and you're down at like one one hundredth, I can guarantee you it's, it's, it's not going to be sharp. So, you know, with experience shooting, uh, you can start to push those limits a little bit more. You get a little bit more sort of comfortable with the camera, as I said. These cameras are incredible because they have the optical stabilization in the lens. They have the in-body five axis as well. Um, you can start to lower the shutter speeds um, and you can be very creative doing panning shots or, or motion blur shots. But it also helps expand the low light capability as well. Um, it takes time and experience. There's, you know, wildlife photography, I would say, is sort of 50% uh, field craft. It's 50% camera craft. What the 6K and 4K video does is if you're learning and you're getting into that space and you don't want to blow your shot, you actually want to bag it, you know, you want to bank your shot, just put that, that mode on. You know, you're going to get a great little clip, which is, a, you know, a great souvenir, great memory. And then you can actually go through it and you can, you know, just like the, the I can never remember the, the burst rate, the G9's got a phenomenal burst rate. And, you know, for bird photographer, that's great. Well, You've got the same in the 6K, uh, the 6K video mode. You can just, or 6K photo mode. You can just scroll, scroll through and take out a whole sequence of in, images. And, and the JPEGs look fine. Um, yeah. People say, oh, you've got to shoot raw, you've got to shoot raw. No, not always. It doesn't make sense <laughs> always to shoot raw. And in fact, I had an article published, I think it was in, in Amateur Photographer magazine last year, talking about the reasons why I, I often shoot JPEG. I mean, sometimes I can fill cards with you know, thousands and thousands of photos on, on a shoot. If I'm going somewhere where, for example, I don't want to take my, my, uh, my PC, I don't want to take my, my MacBook, I don't want to take my, my disc, um, I shoot JPEG because then I can just basically fill the cards up. I can get more, more images on there. So, you know, six, 6K and 4K photo mode uh, just bring a huge amount of versatility. Um, and I've seen a lot of good, well, I've shot good images, but I've seen a lot of good images out there of people using it. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and that's, that's, that's that point of, you know, like understanding your equipment and knowing the, the use case you're going into, like you said, there's, there's a time and place to shoot raw. And, it, and, and to, just to be clear for everyone in, in the comments too, these are all personal choices as well. You know, if, yeah. if you're someone who loves to shoot raw, by all means, go, go shoot raw. That's awesome. Um, you know, the, it's it's about that flexibility. The JPEG engine in the Lumix cameras can be massively customized to your style. Like, you know, if, if you like, you know, more punchy, vibrant JPEGs, you can easily just tell the camera, you know, hey, I want saturation up, I want sharpness up, or I want noise reduction turned down. It gives you a lot of that control. Um, and, and 
especially in situations like, you know, like you're saying, if you're limited with weight and travel restrictions for the equipment you can bring, sometimes, you know, making that decision, do you bring a laptop or do you bring a tablet? Yeah. And do you really want to go through the process of storing all those images? What's required to store all those images? Because SD cards are great, but you know, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, you probably want to back up some of your content as well, Absolutely. <laughs> which yeah. takes extra equipment. Um, and JPEGs have come a long way in some ways <laughs> than, than they did years ago. So there, there's, there's definitely a lot of advantage there. Um, so I'm going to actually change the screen over here. And uh, so for everyone on the stream, we've got the, uh, some of John's photos are just going to be kind of playing around through here. Uh, you know, while, while we continue the conversation, uh, once, once one of them comes up, we'll probably pause on it. And if you guys have questions about, you know, any one of the images that you see here, drop it in the chat and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of talk about, you know, how, how that image was created, uh, aside from the ones that, that I'm going to pick out because there's some in here that I'm, I'm curious how, how, uh, you, you got the shot, John. Um, but you know, when, when someone, uh, you know, kind of rounding back to that question we had before about, you know, what, what camera do you recommend for people to, to, to choose? You know, we, we were having the conversation beforehand about, yeah. you know, not, not everybody needs or may want an interchangeable lens camera. There are situations where, you know, obviously reach is really important, but some of the other, the, you know, kind of bridge point and shoot cameras can also fit really well. Um, for someone looking into that, do you have recommendations or a preferred yeah. bridge camera that you've worked with? Yeah, so I've worked with the the FZ2000 uh, quite a lot because, um, first of all, it's very compact and light. And as I, as I mentioned, what's in my kit bag, the last trip that I took to uh, to South Africa, um, I actually took an FZ2000 with me. Now, a lot of people say, well, what are you doing taking another camera? You've got a GH5, you've got a G9. So I'm going to a location that's like dusty. It's a desert. You know, we had storms, we had thunder, we had rain. Although there was a drought, we did actually get rain. And I'm in an open game drive vehicle, right? So I've got fast moving subjects. I don't know what I'm going to see. Um, they might come towards me quite quickly. I don't want to be opening up my lenses, right? So I've got my, G, my G9 here. I've got my GH5. I just want to switch bodies. So the other thing that I absolutely don't want to do is I don't really want to have to mess around changing from stills camera settings to video camera settings. They're very different and they're kind of on a scale that they're, they're really opposites. So just to give you an example, with stills, I shoot aperture priority mode. So in aperture priority mode, I take the creative choice on the depth of field. Okay, there's some limitations with the lens, obviously with a, a variable focal lens. So like the 100, 400, if I'm at 100 millimeters, it's at f4. If I go to 400, it's at f6.3. Um, but I make that creative choice. If, for example, I'm at 100, I can go f4, f6.3, f whatever, I can go up. Um, yeah. What I then do is I use the ISO to make sure that um, I actually have my shutter speed. So that by pushing the ISO up or down, it, it basically moves the, the shutter speed up and down. So it, it's really easy for me because I'm just looking in the, the viewfinder, pushing my ISO up and then checking that, that my shutter speed is at least twice the focal length. So I'm, if I'm at 400 millimeters, and I'm shooting birds, I want it to be at 800th of a second. So that's kind of how I shoot. Now, if I shoot video, and if I was to do that with one of these hybrid cameras, the GH5 G9, I actually want to be at 150th. I want to be in manual mode. I want to probably have a very ND, like sunglasses for your lens, right? So imagine that I've got all that, and then suddenly I see this incredible sighting, and I'm like, you know, I turn, I hit the button, and I hear the beep, and it goes to video mode, and I'm like, oh, no, what am I doing? You know, I don't want to have to mess around. And it's happened to me. It, it, I've, I've messed that up. So I have the FZ2000. I can get a, a professional uh, microphone on top of it. It's got built-in ND filters. That's just, I mean, Southern Africa with all the light, that just, it's just magical to have those, those uh, variable NDs. And you've got 480 millimeters uh, yeah. focal length. And the other thing is it's like a GH4. So it's like, it's got all that 4K goodness in. You can actually punch in when you're in, in post. You don't have to worry about being at 600 millimeters or beyond. You know that as long as you've got, kind of got the frame, you've got the subject centered in the frame, you just punch in in post. So yeah, the FZ2000, I think, is a phenomenal camera. Um, and I've actually used it for stills as well. Uh, it, it works just as well for stills. And I think the only thing that probably would stop me putting it in the bag is if I was really like you know, 
specialist birding safaris where you've got to be, you know, you've got that longer focal length. But an all rounder, if you're going to kind of go to places like Kruger National Park or Madikwe, um, you know, Pillensburg, these sorts of areas where there's kind of a lot of tourists go uh, and it's a general game, game area, that kind of bridge camera would be absolutely perfect. Nice. Yeah, and, and that's that's definitely a really good point too, is you know, about, about weather sealing and, and weather resistance in cameras. You know, it's cameras are only weather resistant when they're complete, when you've got a lens yeah. on it, when you've got the battery door closed. Uh, you know, in some cases there every manufacturer has different, you know, kinda um asterisks next to what makes the camera fully weather resistant. So being able to have a camera like, you know, some of the higher FZ series or even the FZ 300. Um, I saw there were, uh, there was at least a, a person or two in the, the comments that mentioned that they use that camera. You know, you're getting those weather resistant cameras, you're getting long reach. Are they, you know, a, a different tier than, you know, the interchangeable lens cameras? Yes. But ultimately, getting an image that you're happy with getting you know having the camera to get you the reach especially in situations like this is such an important thing that you know having it is better than not having anything and the quality you're going to get is still going to be so much better than than having you know a, a comp well there's not really anything comparable from the cell phone world so <laughs> it kind of throws that yeah. that whole perspective out of it um so with the, because uh, uh, there, there was actually one question here from, uh, uh, looks like a question from Beverly, or really a statement, but it is a question, um, about teleconverters. So I, I know you mentioned that you use the 50 to uh, fifty to 200. Um, do you use the teleconverters on that at all, or you stick that as Not, just the... Yeah. So I don't use the teleconverter on anything that's a variable focal length. So Panasonic's got the 200 millimeter f2.8 lens. Um, I'd use the teleconverters there. Um, now, shooting with a fixed focal length is very different to variable. Uh, you mm. have to think a little bit more and anticipate where you're going to get yourself into position. Um, but the great thing about the 1.4 and the 2x teleconverters is, again, you have one lens, you've got three focal lengths. So from a travel perspective, if you do need to have that tool in your bag, it's, it's easy. It's really easy. Um, I don't shoot too much with that, um, with the 200. It's, it's, I do have it but I, I don't use it very often. And the reason I don't use it very often is because I do shoot this wide range of subjects. So uh, I have things that come very close to the vehicle and then I, have, I do a lot of bird photography and bird photography, I need that extra, that extra focal length. So, you know, I don't want to be changing the teleconverters when I'm in a game vehicle in, in, a, in a dusty environment. I just want to have one lens that does everything. Uh, if I was in a hide, for example, um, then I probably would look at the 200 millimeter. If I was in a, a fixed position where I know the subjects are going to come at a specific distance to that fixed position, then that means I can fill the frame with a fixed focal length. Uh, I have to say though that there is an advantage with the, um, the 200 millimeter because it's an f2.8 lens. So I get mm -hmm. a couple of extra stops of light. So again, for low light photography and where I live in Belgium, uh, it's not very bright for most of the year. We, we struggle with light. So uh, if I do bird bird high photography, then I will take the 200 millimeter with me because it just gives me that additional uh, stop of light. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, to to follow up uh, with uh, your question, Beverly. Uh, so the the 100 to 400 does not have teleconverter capabilities, mainly because if you put a 1.4 or a 2x converter on there, um, the aperture ends up stopping down so much because of the the light loss. Uh, that you wouldn't be able to focus with it. So unfortunately, the one to four hundred doesn't have teleconverter capabilities. Um, so I I just paused the um, the uh, uh, stills that we've been playing here because um, I'm curious, you know, talking about you know the the birds in flight and 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 that's that style of photography because that's its own world in wildlife yeah. photography as well. Um, the image I stopped on is the the uh, looks like an eagle or a falcon with its uh, wings spread I've, full out. I've got it in front of me, Sean. So yeah, I, it's yeah. called a, cool. ba a batelier eagle. It's a very distinctive bird in Southern Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you give us some some of the you know kind of uh, you know background on that? Like you know what what focus modes do you use when you're shooting with something like this? You know how yeah. how do you handle tracking? Okay, there's, a, there's quite an interesting story behind this image because um, 
So it was from the KTP, so Caligali Transfrontier National Park. In, uh, so it's between South Africa and, and, and Botswana. And I took it in October last year. And what you do is you, you drive on these roads and you come up to the, you can stop at these water holes. And we actually stop at each water hole. You might be in an open plain area and you might see some game. We found actually that there were some vultures and we could see a couple of backlears. Actually, they circle around. Now, I was on a specialist um, photo safari with a good friend of mine who was guiding and he was sat in the, what I call the jump seat. So he was right next to the, the, the guide in the, in the passenger seat. And then there were some guests in front of me. I was at the back. And so the roof, like a, uh, a sort of a canopy roof on, on the vehicle. Um, my friend, who was the guide, had the best view because he could see straight up this, this battle which was right at the, the top. The guests could see next. I could see nothing. It was like me having like this. I just I couldn't <laughs> oh, see anything man. at all. And they were getting great shots because they, they had their, their cameras pointing like this and, and I had nothing at all. So I was kind of like trying to look out the side of the vehicle, had my camera up, up into my eye and suddenly I heard a burst of, you know, camera burst in front of me. So I could see my friend had it in, in view and suddenly I just saw him, I saw him drop. I had no time at all. So I just basically threw, threw the camera at it. Uh, hit the focus button and, and shot a burst and I got that image. So um, I'd like to say that was skill, but it was more kind of luck, but luck than judgment, but I was very happy with it. <laughs> so just to kind of build on what you said about focusing, a couple of things that I read on Lumix uh, websites, the, the, the Facebook pages and some of the things that I contribute to, a lot of people complain and whinge about um, bird in flight and the autofocus system and so on. And um, I just keep <laughs> things super simple. I, I said before, it's like 50% equipment, 50% camera cap craft. If you don't have the camera craft, this camera is, no camera is going to get the, the subject in focus. You've got to have some knowledge about it. So there's a couple of things I do. I, unusually, I use the AFS. So I don't use continuous, I use AFS. And I do actually set up my focus on the back button focus, which is, which is kind of here. And there's a reason for that. I want to dissociate the focus from the button. Um, and I mean, if you're interested to get more information or the viewers are interested to get more information on that, I've, I've got a blog and I've, I've blogged a lot about the reason why I use back button focus. You can, you can look at johnbryantphotography.net. Just look at my blog. You'll find it there. Yeah. I just hit the back button really quick. It locks on and then I've got the burst speed. It's all about with birds in flight. It's all about your ability to pan and track with the, with the camera and coming back to this, these, all these things are linked, Sean. This is what's why it's so important. Yeah. Having the, having the lightweight and compact form factor is so much easier for me to track and pan with the, with the bird or the moving subject than if I have a very heavy camera. I, I shoot aperture priority. It means I only have to worry about moving that ISO. The aperture, will, um, sorry, the shutter speed will take care of itself. And, and then I just hit the focus button and away, away you go. So I kind of push back on those people that say like, you know, bird in flight, you know, micro four thirds, the Lumix system is not so great. I've got some incredible bird in flight um, shots. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and they're in focus. They really are in focus. So, uh, again, what I advocate to people is just practice, practice, practice. Because if you were to go to a more expensive camera system with a bigger lens, uh, I guarantee that your, your hit rate will, won't be as good as what you can get on this. It will be as, as good or, or even worse. So, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, I, I, I think with, with a lot of, of styles of photography, you know, that, that kind of core message of actually knowing your equipment and being comfortable with it is, is really the, the forefront of you being able to capture the images that, that, that you want to get. Um, and obviously lots of practice being able to go out and yeah, Maybe maybe like a, a, a dash of luck in there every once in a while because you know yeah. let's be honest luck luck is a is is a big part of photography and videography absolutely for yeah. for a lot of things um so when when you are shooting uh you know for birds in flight um I I presume that you're using burst mode which I I think you said before right yeah 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 absolutely so there's there's two two modes there's like one and two. Two you need two you kind of get that ridiculously fast rate where you need the ultra fast cards. I actually don't use that. For me, one is good enough. Um, the reason for that is with 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 the second mode, whilst it's useful, um, obviously you have some limitations with the buffer. And so what I like to do is I like to shoot a burst, let the buffer clear, and then I go again. And that's why I use the, the first mode on it. I can't, 
I should know it, but I can't remember the number of frames per second that he shoots. But it's it's more than enough for what I do, and I, I've always been very happy. Uh, but what, again, what I would say is don't get like trigger happy. So I think one of the things in wildlife photography, talking more kind of on the field craft part, is mm-hmm. actually anticipating the subject and what it does and picking your moment to get the shot. Again, we talked a little bit about um, storage, SD cards. Um, you know, the last thing I want to do at the end of a game drive uh, or the end of the day is just go through my cards and start deleting images that I'm not happy with. It takes a lot of time to do that because you're going through them one by one. So with experience, you start to understand kind of what it is you're going to shoot, what, how you anticipate the animal, uh, the kind of conditions that you want to shoot in. Um, so it's really a combination of those things. And what I like about the G9 in particular is it's, it's extremely intuitive to use. Um, it, everything's where it should be. Um, and I, I can really shoot with it with my eyes closed. That's, that's what's, I, I don't have to think about it. Um, I can concentrate more on that field craft aspect. I mean, even to the point where I'll take my glasses off slightly, but I just love this viewfinder. So I can yeah. actually have, I mean, I used to shoot like this, Sean. So I'd shoot with, with this eye closed. And now I'm shooting like this, and I'm actually looking at the subject with my eye open. And I can see with such clarity what I'm doing. So it enables me to look with periphery vision to my left, whether there's other animals coming into the shot, and I can anticipate. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, just the design and the form factor of the camera is, is, is tremendous. Yeah. Yeah, you know, with 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 a lot of the the you know kind of cameras that we've come out over the years, I I, I do have to agree. You know, the the G nine has become one of those cameras that I can pick it up even after like say a couple of months of not using it. You know, jumping you know because I've been working with the S cameras a lot recently. I can just pick that thing up and it's just pure muscle memory of like yeah. where everything is and it just you know kind of flows, which is why I was so happy that when we did launch the S series, the full frame cameras that we, you know, kind of beefed up the G9 into that series, you know, it has a lot of the similar ergonomics. Um, I, I, I stopped on another image here because I'm, I'm, I'm curious if there's a, a a story behind this image um, of the, the backlit, uh, again, I, I, I'm horrible with, with wildlife. Uh, Eagles or vultures. Vultures, there you go. Yeah, white neck vulture. So there's yeah. two of them. Yeah. I'm 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 curious if there's a story behind it or or you know what what went into to getting this image. Yeah, so th- there is a couple of stories there. So um <laughs> earlier in the day um we were really fortunate uh, on one specific area of the of the park. Uh again it's at KTP in in South Africa, the Kalagadi. Um what was incredible that day is that uh, the lions were very very active. Um, there's another image in the series of um, two elands with a sun setting. And I just highlight that because e- elands are actually Africa's largest antelope. Um, and there was a couple of old elands that were actually in the riverbed. It's a dry riverbed. And the lions took two of them down not far from each other. So um, there's another image you see with a, a blooded uh, female lion that was eating on one carcass. This was the second carcass a little bit further up the road. Uh, and the lions had actually um, left it behind. When we came back at the end of the day, uh, we had the sun behind us, and there were probably about 50 to 60 vultures, which was an incredible sight to see itself because you actually see hierarchy at play. You see a certain number of vultures that are feeding off it, and all the others are waiting, not daring to approach the carcass. Um, and so light was, light was at a premium, and it was fading. Um, and so it's always a very delicate matter to, to kind of photograph a kill. Um, yeah. You can either kind of zoom out and just tell, do a proof shot and say, okay, here's a dead animal, but that's not much to look at. And so for me, one of the things that I wanted to do was try and create a feeling of, of some kind of um, a feeling that it was ominous. It was kind of dark, um, to really create a, 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 a quite a somber mood. So with the, the side light and the back light, uh, it was just really kind of like reflecting there. What I actually did was I underexposed. I think I underexposed by about two stops. Um, so I wanted to kind of have the, the front of the, the vultures just uh, a little bit in shadow. You could see the details so you could understand what it was, but I wanted to really make that background quite dark. And then rather than show the whole of the carcass, I just put a very thin layer at the bottom to, to give that hint that, okay, Something's been killed. This is the what we call in, in Africa that it's the natural life cycle, right? So, one species is feeding off the other. So the vultures have life thanks to the, the life cycle and the death of the eland. Um, but I, I think it works pretty well, and I like the fact that um, 
compositionally you've kind of got this very dominant vulture uh, on one yeah. side of the frame and then you've got the one in the background that's kind of a little bit more submissive so um, yeah it, and again it's just kind of for me proves that point that a lot of people say micro four thirds you can't shoot in low light it you know, if you push the ISO, it gets noisy. Well, this is one of those images that if you play smart and you think about what the light's doing and you think about the creative choices that you make, you use the camera features and you start to create these images in, in what I think is a very compelling way. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, that's that's the thing that, that really struck me when I when when you sent these photos over to me, I, you know, I was looking at them and, you know, there's there's such that that attention to detail for lighting and composition that, you know, yes, there, there are situations where, you know, you, you don't have control over the background or you don't have control over the framing. And it's really, you know, kind of that, that luck of the draw, if it's going to play well as an image, but this image, as I was, you know, scrolling through them, it, it really like, you know, made me stop and look at it because, you know, it, it, it exemplifies that, that, you know, control over, over your, your craft, you know, what, what you're looking to get out of it, that, that, you know, beautiful rim light and that kind of gold, you know, kind of glow of the image, it, it pushes it past a photo of, you know, a kill and really, you know, does kind of show that story. So I, I, I think at least from my perspective that, you know, the, the look you were going for with it really, you know, worked it, it it really exemplified that and you know that's that's a hard thing for people to i think get comfortable with being able to 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 do in in photography yeah. <laughs> so i i uh, uh just just kicked the video uh so so that it's it's gonna continue some more images here um i just want to make one comment uh for anyone in the chat that seems to possibly be having some video or audio uh issues try reloading youtube um on our side i just double checked our stream looks like it's going through perfectly fine at least to youtube's end um sometimes that can help uh on 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 youtube side so uh but uh, a little bit of a, you know, kind of update there too. If you want to rewatch these streams, these are always posted live again or uh, reposted up after we finish these conversations, usually within about an hour or so. So anything we talk about, um, links to the blog, links to, to images, all that kind of stuff, we will always update the uh, description for these videos. So you guys will be able to continue learning from John after this. Uh, so definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, again, for those that have joined us since we started, if you guys have questions for John or myself, uh, make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras in the chat, uh, and myself, John, or Jack in the chat will uh, ad address them as fast as we can uh, and address topics that we can as well. So, um, John, I, I I just stopped on the the uh, the high key image um, that you sent over here. There's there's so many questions I have about this one. <laughs> so, it's a gray heron. Yeah. So yeah. with this image, was it, was it shot on, you know, a, a relatively white background or, you know, how, how, how did you go about creating this image? Yeah. It's a good question. I can't remember the camera I shot it on. Uh, <laughs> shot it on. Uh, I think it might've been the GH5, might've even been the GH4. Um, and this is actually probably about two kilometers from where I live. I actually live in an urban area, but we have a very small lake um, and it was in winter. And I'd actually been to, there's, there's a very large forest um, just south of Brussels. And I, I often go to that forest, do some forest photography, some birding and so on. I was driving back and, and as I was driving back, I kind of looked and, and saw that the lake was semi-frozen, a little bit of a little bit of slush on there, so it wasn't completely frozen. And this heron, was just sort of stood there. Um, and I thought, well, okay, I know herons quite well. If I try and go anywhere near it, it's going to just fly away. But I was quite fortunate, <laughs> the other side of the lake, there was a road. And so I thought if I, if I drive up there and don't get out of my car, there's a, probably a good chance I'm gonna get the shot. And that's exactly what I did. I wound the window down, put my lens out, and I was at a relatively good angle. So at the angle, the light was just reflecting enough, um, enough to really create that reflection. And um, a heron, it's kind of like quite light colors with a little bit of black, gray, there's a little bit of yellow on the beak. So I just, I think I pushed it to maybe one and a half stops over. 
Um, and really, I, I pushed it to the point where maybe the the part of the the ice that wasn't formed, you could see the ice in the water. You could no longer see it. it was just that idea of high key white. Um, yeah. And again, it's just one of those things where you get experience from you. You start to understand a little bit um, when you can shoot low key, when you can shoot high key. Uh, and I would always recommend people just give it a try. You know, you take one at, at dead on exposure and don't be and again. I mean, it's super simple with this button here just to push it you know, overexposed, underexposed, um, you can take five shots and then look at, look at what's best and you learn from it. So I'd, I'd done quite a lot of black and white high key images of birds a couple of years ago. So I had that experience. This one I preferred to do in color because I actually like it's the small details often that, that hit me, but I actually like the small shadow that you see, the yeah. very light gray shadow underneath, which just shows that it's not Photoshopped. It's not a different background that actually, which, you know, I'm, I'm not making any, assertions or implications but you know in wildlife photography we do have that problem from time to time but this is this you would the raw image would be the same as you see it's just uh, i basically pushed the uh, push the exposure a couple of stops out yeah 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 and 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 that's that's also i mean this 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 stream is awesome you know because there's there's so many good points for for people to kind of hopefully take away from this as i smack my microphone um <laughs> you know the that there's there's different times to use different modes in the cameras, you know, aperture, shutter, manual, those kinds of things. I, I've always been a firm believer of using things like aperture or shutter priority, depending on the situation you're in, because of opportunities like this, where, you know, just like you said, you want to be able to try this as a high key image, you know, just tapping that exposure button and rolling the rear dial really quick. Yeah. You're going to be so much faster for the most part than someone who's got their camera in full manual and is having to make those adjustments themselves. That's not to diminish anyone who shoots full manual or anything like that, because that's a, that's a skill in its own, but you know, having the camera not be in your way so that you can get the idea and the vision that you want is, is, is such an important thing that a lot of people I think overlook. And you know, the, the images that you've shown or that, that, that we're showing here, are, are that kind of testament to that, you know, being able to, to capture and create these beautiful images and, and, you know, content that, that people have been saying in the chat here, you know, how, how beautiful the images are. It, it comes down to skill and, and experience and, and understanding of your equipment. And hey, yes, yeah, so, uh, some of the comments there from, uh, from people about being full manual shooters. Yeah. It, it, there's so much, so much about it. Um, I wanted. I, I I just stopped on the uh, the. I think I'm gonna get it right. It's a pygmy falcon, image. Yeah, well done, Sean. Yeah, yeah pygmy I got it falcon, right. Because yeah. <laughs> I think how did I describe it originally? The little baby bird on the on the yeah, branches. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Again, shows you how much I know about this topic. Um, could you give us uh, you know some some info on this? Um, because I, I I was blown away. I had no idea about you know what what this falcon is. Yeah. So, so this is the world's smallest bird of prey. Um, they're, they're very interesting birds. They actually sometimes invade and take over weaver nests. In, in South Africa, you have these big nests where you have weaver birds that construct them and, and they'll often go in. Sometimes they'll kill the weavers as well. Um, but they're tiny and they're extremely extreme. I mean, when I say tiny, they're about the size of my hand, which for like a, a, wow. a bird of prey is nothing. Um, I saw a lot of them, actually. Uh, I say a lot. I, I think I saw five or six of them when I was there. Um, and, and they're beautiful, beautiful birds. Um, this was a relatively straightforward shot to take because we spotted him. He was close to the road. Um, there are a lot of deadwood trees that are there with the branches. And for me, I would say this is like the wildlife photographer's dream because the only thing I need to think about is do I want to shoot it landscape or portrait orientation? So I did both. Um, <laughs> This one I actually put as kind of landscape orientation because I just like the negative space on the, on the left side of the frame a little bit. He, he turned his head the opposite way. Um, so it kind of complements that. But what was great about this was just having, I can't remember what time it was shot. I think it was maybe like 10 a.m. So, you know, sun rises up. It's not too high in the sky, so it's not too harsh. And you've got that deep, rich blue uh, sky. Oh, yeah. And that gives it the canvas. And so one of the things I always advocate um, to, to people that I... I you know, aspiring to be wildlife photographers. And when I sometimes I do some, some, um, some teaching is um, just keep things simple. Sometimes, you know, you can get such beautiful images by not overcomplicating things. Um, and the other thing is 
often we focus on the subject more than actually the, the frame. And what, what yeah. one of the kind of top tips I give is let the subject take care of itself. If it's relatively static, or in this case, this pygmy falcon wasn't going to go anywhere. It, stood, it was just sat there for about 20 minutes and we watched it. If I'd had clutter or if I'd had like invasive little branches or leaves at the top of it, I'm pointing around my frame to give you an example of what it would look like. But, you know, I, I don't want to have those. So it, it's about recomposing and trying to get a very clean image with a clean background. And some people might say, well, it's a proof shot, but, you know, I mean, that, that image has been printed out. I've actually sold that image. Uh, it's actually, it's it's on exhibition in my, my hometown, uh, a medical center. So, yeah, I mean, it's like... Um, just keep it simple it's it's that's the message oh yeah yeah <laughs> photography these days and, and and videography to that point always tends to kind of get you know not not necessarily muddied but you know distracted with over complication of process and and you know what what effect can be thrown on it and again that's the that's something that really strikes me with with a lot of your images is that these are images that, you know, from looking at it, just have that, you know, that that realism edit to them. You know, it's not it's not done to be hyper realistic or or this this you know kind of overdone look. They're they're natural. They they really do convey the subject that you're photographing, not not a a a, a concept to to match something yeah. else. It's it, it's it's refreshing to see images like this. Um, I think one of the images I want to stop on that's coming up is of the the bucks, uh, the, the 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 two that you have because there's something. This one actually, yeah. Let me make sure I can pause it here. So um, this is the shot the the shot with the the single buck. Um, could you give us some info on this because this I think is one of those shots that kind of exemplifies the the opposite of what a lot of people criticize micro four thirds for not being able to do, you know, the shallow depth of field subject isolation and, and the sharpness. Um, could you give us a little background on this image? So this one's not a really good example, Sean, for the micro four thirds, because I shot it with the S1R. So, oh, um, well, hey, but, but I, can, I can, I can give you a prompt on, on which one for the shallow depth of field. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perfect. Can, then there's, there's a, there's a couple in there, but I'll just talk a little bit why I put this one in. So, yeah, yeah. um, the S1R, okay, it's full frame, um, it's slightly heavier camera. And um, a lot of people are probably thinking, you know, could it be used for wildlife? So this was shot in the UK last November, just at the end of the deer rut. Uh, it's a red deer. And um, I was, you know, at that time, um, the, the lens roadmap still wasn't where it should be, I would say. Uh, there were not long lenses. So I actually had a, a Sigma lens that was 120 to 300, so I was using an adapter on it. Um, and I wanted to test it out. I wanted to see what I could get. And these subjects are relatively slow. So yeah. um, I don't have to worry too much about focusing speed and so on. The, the images of all of the red deer images you see in the, the slideshow there, they were all shot with the S1R. They are phenomenal. The quality, the resolution, the color rendition is incredible. Honestly, Sean, it, it blew my mind. And so whilst <laughs> I still, you know, my, my workhorse is the G9 for a number of reasons, um, there are times when I will go with the S1R. If the, you know, for example, if the subject's relatively slow, relatively static, I want to do more portrait images or animals in the environment, you know, that's when, I, when I'll do that. But if you kind of go on the slideshow to the Kingfisher, which is um, quite yeah. a colorful bird on the barbed wire. Um, okay. And that you one know, well, is a good example of the shallow depth of field. Nice. Yeah. So this is actually, I think, one of those kind of surprising things because you know, some, someone like myself that works with our cameras day in and day out, you know, I'm used to typically being able to look at, you know, which camera was, which one was taken out. I, I, I genuinely saw that, you know, the, the really was, was no indication to me like, Oh, Hey, those were full frame versus the micro four thirds. So like, I <laughs> totally sounds like a cop out coming from me as, as like, you know, the, the rep for the brand, but like legitimately, Going through the images, I think that speaks even bigger volumes to the fact that if you understand what you're doing with your camera and you understand the craft that you're actually trying to shoot, it, it echoes that point you made that it, it almost doesn't really matter what which camera you're using because you can still get stunning results out of cameras that may not even be designed for the topic, but 
once you have that control and you have that understanding, you can make stunning images that stand up right next to cameras that people traditionally put in their mind as being the superior option. And you know, like I said, the whole list of, of images that we've got here, once, once the, uh, the uh, uh, Kingfisher comes up, you know, that's that just like you said, that's that was one of my other, you know, kind of images that I looked at going, you know, depth of field control and framing and, and just the way the camera works, it really just just blows my mind what what can be done in the hands of someone who understands it. Um, there was there's a, a, one of the questions here from Philip while we're waiting for the, the images to come back to the, the Kingfisher. Um he asked, uh, was there any particular technique you used to ensure that the target was in focus rather than the deadwood or the background um, for the uh, the uh, falcon Pick me image? Falcon. Yeah. yeah. So I just used single point focus um, and then I used the joystick. And actually, uh, the single point focus, you can make the square larger or smaller. So if I make it larger, the autofocus may drift a little bit, especially if you have, I'll do it this way, if you kind of have like a few centimeters, the, the camera will pick that up. So it will get this in focus and this will be out. Now that's actually important for if you're relatively close to subjects and you're using a low f-stop, so 2.8 or 4, um, you'll get the nose in focus and maybe the ears out. Um, that was a small subject in a, in a very narrow focal plane, so it was relatively simple to do. But the, the small square uh, really helps me precisely get the focus on what it is I want. With regards to like birds on a perch like that, what I would do is I'd always recommend shooting at probably 6.3 or 7.1. And there's a reason for that. Birds are perched up there. They're not going to stay there forever. At some point, they're going to they're gonna fly off. And um, you've got to anticipate that. And if you're at 6.3, 7.1, when they spread their ring, wings, you've got a much better chance of getting everything in focus for the first few frames that they take off. Once they're out that focal plane, you can forget it. They'll be out of focus. Um, you, yeah. you just you, even if you pan it, it's gone. So if you're at like f4, or if you had like an f2.8 lens, as soon as that bird moves, you're going to get something out of focus. So the 6.3, 7.1 kind of bracket bracket range is uh, I shouldn't use the word bracket because we talk about bracketing <laughs> in photography as well. But <laughs> what I mean is, is like that that kind of um, scale six six yeah 6.3, 7.1 is the best for that type of scenario where you've got a bird on a perch. Nice. Hey, yeah, that's 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 awesome. Um, so, one of the other questions, actually, um, and then and then we'll we're actually coming up on the hour already. We'll we'll round out with the uh, the the kingfisher here. Um, when when you shoot, do you use uh, the mechanical shutter or electronic shutter? Do you find yourself mixing them? Mechanical. Mechanical. Yeah. Cool. Now there are some instances you could use electronic. So if I'm in a hide, you obviously want to be silent. Um, but I just, I don't, don't ask me why I prefer the mechanical. It's that feeling of kind of like click it's, there's no rationale to it. I guess it's just like, you know, maybe cause I've got a few more gray hairs and I remember the day when I used to shoot on film cameras, you know, you want to have that sort of like, and the electronic one for me, it's like, sometimes I'll click and it's like, did I take the image? You know, you're not quite sure. So yeah, I, I always shoot mechanical. Yeah. 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 It, it... Pretty much the same here too. Um, so for a little bit of a technical thing here for a lot of the, the people that may be asking, you know, well, what are the advantages or disadvantages between mechanical and electronic? Specifically for this style of photography, there can be advantages to an electronic shutter because in traditional cameras, electronic shutters are much more stable than a mechanical shutter. But one of the cool things that we've done with a lot of the shutter mechanisms in the Lumix cameras is they're dampened well enough that you don't have shutter shock issues, which years ago there was a big spike in, in instances of shutter shock. I, uh, so using the actual mechanical shutter gives you that, that audible feedback, that tactile feedback that it's there. And you can comfortably know that you can use it on cameras like the G nine and the S series without much of an issue for any kind of residual shake that potentially could happen. Um, so, just like we're saying, we're we're rounding out at the hour now, um, and I want to 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 finish off on this um, this kingfisher here. If you can give us some some insight onto this image, yeah, this was shot actually on the GH4 quite some time ago, 
um, after going to Africa quite a lot, um, I actually took a, a conscious decision in Europe because obviously we don't have the same amount of species diversity in Europe. I mean, we have foxes and we have deer and we have badgers, uh, and uh, but but it requires a lot of field craft to, to find them. And I, I live in Belgium, um, and there's a lot of urbanisation, uh, so it's it's not that easy to find those those types of species. But you know, birds are everywhere. Um, and then the other thing was like I thought, well, if I'm going to get good at this. Um, I've got to, if I can be good at bird photography, I can pretty much be good at, um, you know, static subjects, slower subjects, bigger subjects, elephants, giraffes, and so on. Birds are very hard to shoot. They move fast. They're small. They really push the limits of your camera. So I spent about um, a year and a half just shooting birds in Europe nonstop. Um, and this was from a specialist hide. Um, it took me a while to actually get a kingfisher. It was sort of a bit of a mission for me. Um, and I'll just talk a little bit about the, the background. So the, the location I shot it from, it was from a fixed hide. Um, it had a glass window on it. So, of course, that sort of cuts down the light, light a little bit. Um, but it's on a lake. There's a lake in the background, which is why you've kind of got a sort of it's cut from top to bottom. The bottom's lighter. That's the water. And then the top is green. And that's the reflection of some of the trees in the background. Um, what I did with this image is I kind of tried to get myself within the hide relatively low. So I was at the same high level as the bird. Um, and the reason for that is I think there's a big myth with these micro four thirds cameras that, uh, you know, you can't get shallow depth of field. And, and also in the wildlife community, there's a, a general feeling that you've got to have that soft, creamy bokeh in the background to make a really aesthetically pleasing image. There's some argument around that, but I don't always buy into it. So, for me, this was one of those where you've got to know a little bit that field craft piece. So I was shooting with, the, again, the 100-400. It's the longest lens I have. At 400 millimeters, I'm at f6.3. I can't go any lower than that. But what I know is that actually it's not the aperture that has the biggest factor on depth of field. It's the distance between the subject and the background. So yep. if your background's here, it doesn't matter if you're f2.8 or 11. It's always going to be in focus. But if you actually, you know, if, if you've got a background here, oh, let me do it that way. If you've got a background here and you're pointing up, right, you're going to get that in. So if you then point your camera in that direction and you, you're not shooting in the background, you get this soft, creamy bokeh in the background. So having that knowledge of the impact of the background with the subject is, is what's going to make or break your image if you want to go for that soft, shallow depth of field. Um, I have some similar images. I didn't include them, Sean, but again, if people want to go to yeah. my, my blog, You'll see one on um, a little owl, which has got, you know, that creamy green uh, background and it's very smooth. And I blogged about it specifically to break that myth, which is, you know, people shouldn't be thinking, you know, I've got to have like, oh, the lens is only f4, I need f2.8. No, you can shoot really nice, soft, creamy bokeh backgrounds. You just have to get the angle of attack on the, the subject and you have to know the distance. If you, as I said, if you've got a bird there and it's a hedge behind it, you can forget it. It doesn't matter whether you're down to f, f1. F, you know, some of the some lenses out there on manual focus, you can get f, f uh, 0.9. It, it's not going to change. You're going to see the leaves. You're going to see the the, the the shapes. You know, get that subject separation, and that's going to get you the image. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's that's definitely, I think, you know, a, a really really good point for 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 a lot of people is you know. I, understand the camera that you're working with know how you know compression factors into depth of field things like that just stopping down to stop down or opening up to open up doesn't necessarily help you in all situations um so we've we've gone on for for a little over an hour now um I want to thank you, John, for, for taking the time. I know um, with the time zone differences and, and all that kind of stuff, it's it's a bit later on in the evening out by you. Um, so for for those asking questions in the chat about um, a link for the blog, we uh, I am going to drop the link in the description for this video. So right after we're, we're uh, finished live, uh, I'll get that updated, and you guys will be able to have a link right to go uh, check out the rest of John's work. Um so for for this week, uh, you know, like I said, thank you, John, for for taking the time. Um, for people that want to find you, um, do you have other social media platforms that that you want people to take a look at? Yeah, so I mean, Facebook. I have a, a Facebook page, John Bryant Photography. Um, I'm much more active on Instagram. Um, there, my my tag is uh, at 
John T. Bryant, so that's J-O-N-N-T-Y, Bryant. Um, and I actually put a lot of uh, Lumix images up there, a lot of wildlife, a lot of landscape. Um, and I try to tell the story behind the image as well. So if people are keen to kind of understand how I shot the image. I always put it like uh, some, some comments just underneath it as to kind of what the, the camera was, what the lens is. Um, I, I try to do a combination of sort of entertain and, and, and educate. So have good looking images, but, you know, I'm, I'm not one of those shooters that hides the techniques, how it's done. I like to share that so others can, you know, come up the learning curve and, and develop their passion for photography. That's what it's all about. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. So yeah, for, for everyone that wants to follow along, um, you know, after this stream's over, I'll make sure to leave all those links down in the description. So you guys will be able to, to find, uh, John's information and, and follow along from there. With that, I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us in the chat and providing some awesome questions and some awesome comments in there. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we go live every week on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, the next couple of weeks are going to be really exciting, so make sure to get subscribed. Make sure to like this video if you did. Uh, make sure to get the bell icon on so that you get notifications when we do go live. All of these things help us, you know, continually grow this this channel and this experience that we've set up uh, so that we can provide you guys with more and more content. As always, if you have suggestions or requests for topics you want to see us cover in the future, let us know uh, in all the different social media platforms in comments on these videos. Uh, we are always looking to expand these live streams and get you guys more information that you guys actually want to hear about. So with that, like I said, like, subscribe, uh, follow John and all the different uh, platforms out there, and we will see you guys all next week. <laughs> <laughs>